All right, well, hello and welcome. My name is Celeste. I'm here from National Geographic headquarters in DC. I'm so excited to welcome all of you folks to today's Explorer Classroom. Uh, we're lucky enough today to be talking to Joe Cutler and Zeb Hogan in Mongolia. So they're at a field site that's pretty remote. Ordinarily, they wouldn't even be able to get internet or cell phone signal to talk to us, but we were lucky enough to send them a BGAN unit. So that's a piece of technology about the size and weight of one of your textbooks, and it makes it so that we can briefly connect them to the internet for cool stuff like this. So we're so excited to have them. Um, amazing ichthyologists, um, great dudes studying fish in Mongolia. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to them and let them take it away. Well, hello everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's a cold evening here in Mongolia. We're live streaming from inside of our yurt, or as they're called in Mongolia, a gare, because it is absolutely freezing and frozen outside, and we wouldn't make it through the hour-long stream. So I'm glad to, to have you all here and uh, share this experience. And uh, I'm really happy to have Zeb here because he's kind of the expert on this area and these fishes. So Zeb, why don't you tell us a little bit about where we are and uh, and what we're doing here. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, like just said, we are in Mongolia. Mongolia is a country that's sandwiched between Russia and China in Asia. And uh, I've been working here for about 15 years. We're in a, a yurt right, right now, but we're about 100 feet from the river. And I've been working here for the last 15 years or so because the river, uh, where we're working, is home to the world's largest trout. And so it, it's a trout that can grow up to six feet long. It can weigh up to 200 pounds. And we've been working here uh, for a long time now trying to understand uh, the biology and the ecology of this trout uh, so that it can be uh, better managed and better protected. We're here now uh, with the research team. We've been here about a week. Uh, the weather got really cold a few days ago. It snowed about six inches, so we're all bundled up. Uh, but we go out on the river every day. Uh, we're fishing every day. Uh, taking samples from the fish, taking uh, water samples to try to better understand uh, not only the fish that lives here, this giant trout, but also the river uh, and the ecosystem. That's amazing. And you guys sent us over some slides, some great images that might help classrooms visualize your work a little better. Do you want to talk about those now? Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome, all right. Well, here's your first slide. So this is a photo of, of giant trout. It's also called a taimen or a giant Eurasian trout. And as you can see, these get really big. So this is me in the water with one of these trout. Uh, I'm wearing a dry suit. The water is really cold here at certain times of year, like right now. You can barely even keep your hands in the water for a few seconds before they get numb. And so I'm wearing a dry suit and this is a fish that we caught and we've uh, probably taken a tissue sample to get a little bit of DNA to understand uh, the population gen genetics of the fish. And if you look really closely, you can see a little orange tag by the fish's dorsal fin, the fin on the back of the fish. So we also tag the trout and that gives us an idea of uh, how many trout there are in the river and also uh, their movements. Uh, so we can learn a little bit about their movements and behavior and spawning. Awesome. Here comes the next, next slide. It's on its way. We're just working with a little delay. Yeah, so this is a photo. This is actually a photo from last year, but uh, it looks very similar right now here this year. And this is a photo of our research team or part of our research team. Right now, uh, we're a team of 11 people and it's a pretty unique group of people. Uh, Joe is here. Uh, Joe and I are together as part of National Geographic's mentorship program. Uh, there are also a couple other biologists from the University of Nevada, Reno, where I'm a, where I'm a research biologist. We have some people who love to fish, some anglers 
who've come out here just to fish and they're uh, really good at fishing and they're, and they're the ones that help us find and catch the fish so that we can do our research. And so I guess you, if you look uh, at this photo, you can see our research boats. We have five boats that we use. They're jet boats so they can run. They can drive in about three inches of water. So even when the river is very shallow, we can drive up and down the river in these jet boats. And we spend all day from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. So basically from right after breakfast until dark out on the river, driving these boats around, fishing for giant trout and uh, collecting samples for them. Um, and that's what we did today, uh, yesterday and every day since we've been here. So we, we're here for another three or four days. Every day we're out on the river. And one of the things that's really cool about this year is of the 11 scientists we have out here, four of them are National Geographic Explorers. Just two of us are taking part of this call today because everybody else is finishing up dinner. But it's really a cool and impressive team that we've got out here. Yeah, and, and just to Joe's point, I mean, we have uh, students who've received funding from National Geographic. The first time I received support from National Geographic, I was a student. Joe was a student when he received support from National Geographic. And two or three faculty members out there listening who someday may want to become an explorer or, or do a project in Mongolia. Uh, it's, uh, we're proof that it's possible. There are a lot of people on this team who, who work with National Geographic. Awesome. And here, next slide, please. Next slide. I don't know what's there. <laughs> yeah. So this this is a slide that shows uh, uh, one of our research techniques that we use. And I'm I we're using a tiny little screen here, so I'm looking. But that orange gun in the top of the photo is a tagging gun. So that's a a gun with a, a needle on it and tags, and and that's what we use to tag the fish. So each of those little yellow tags has a number on it. So it might be number one, number two, number three, number four. And we've tagged over the last 15 years about 600 fish. So each of the fish that we tag has a number one up to number 600. And then when those fish are caught again, uh, maybe a year later or five years later or 10 years later, we can identify that fish based on that tag that we implanted into the fish. So that's how we um, identify individual fish. We can track their growth, we can track their movements, uh, and we can even get an idea of, of um, how many of them are being caught by fishermen. So it's, it's a great way for us to, to learn about the fish. Studying fish is a little bit different than studying other animals because fish are in the water and we don't, humans don't live in the water, um, we have to find unique ways to to identify them and to study them. And tagging is one way that biologists do that. You can see down below is a logbook. And so we record um, every fish we catch, the length, the weight, the location where it was captured, uh, the date, and the tag number. And one thing that's really cool about this technique is that it really doesn't affect the fish. It doesn't hurt the fish to tag them with this 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 gun. Um, and the fish can go on living a, a happy life. And every day that they're living, uh, we're collecting more data. So it's, it's a really cool technique. And it's one of the ways that we can study a fish as rare as the taimen that we're studying here. The, the taimen, they're, they're a threatened species. So we actually don't, uh, har we don't kill any of the fish. We don't take them out of the water or, you know, we don't kill them. We do our research and then we release the fish uh, back alive into the river. And some of these fish, a full size fish could be uh, up to 50 years old. So they live a really long time. Uh, this, this is another photo of a taimen. This is a, a smaller one. This is um, in the first years of their life, they grow about 10 centimeters a year. So um, for example, uh, a, a three foot long fish might be anywhere between eight and 10 years old. A six foot long fish would be over 50 years old. So this fish in this photo here is still a young one. They're, they're a beautiful fish. Um, the ones we caught today, for example, they have a green head, uh, a bright coppery red tail and black 
spots all along their body. And the big ones actually have uh, pretty big teeth too. They feed on uh, fish, rodents, ducks. Uh, they can um, they can really eat a large prey. We found an eight pound muskrat in the stomach of one. Um, we found a three foot long fish in the stomach of a, of a large taimen. So they're, they're top predators. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a photo of, of, of a full size fish. You can see how big its head is. So this, this, this is a, a fish that was probably four or five feet long and you can just see that mouth uh, and the teeth in there. That that fish's head is larger than than my hands, than the than the person's hands that's holding that fish. The head of one of these big taimen are bigger than my head, and so it's really an incredible fish. Uh, so this is this is the last day of last year with our with our whole research team. And uh, this is the last fish that we caught. Um, every year, it, it's a little bit different of a research team. There are a few of us that have been coming every year, but every year we, we try to invite people with uh, different skills from different parts of the country uh, to come together for a few weeks to study the giant trout. And one of the things that's really cool and unique about this project here is that we're working with Mongolian scientists and Mongolian fish guides. So on the right side of this photograph is one of our best guides here. His name is Ghana, and he's been working, studying, and, and taking people out to catch these giant trout for 15 years at least. Um, so almost no one in the world knows these fish as well as the people we're working with. And we're just so lucky to have this opportunity to work with local pe people and international researchers to better improve our understanding of these fishes and the rivers that they live in. Yeah, and without the help of, of the Mongolian scientists and Mongolian guides and support of uh, the people here, our work would be impossible. So that's a very important part of the project. Uh, this, I, I don't know how many people recognize what this is. Uh, some of the students who fish, this might look familiar. This is a tackle box. And this is what we use to get, how would you describe it? Maybe you can describe this. Yeah, so these are actually artificial flies. So this, we're, we're mostly fishing with fly fishing, but it's not like the teeny tiny flies that you're used to if you're fishing in the United States. We're using flies that are three or four inches long on a 10 weight rod. So these are big, heavy rods, big, heavy reels, and big, heavy flies because these fish are used to eating, like Zeb said, small rodents, birds, big fish. So unlike trout fishing in the United States, where you may be using something that's patterned after a mosquito, we're using something that's patterned after a fish or a mouse or all sorts of big stuff. So it's for me, I'm used to catching small fish and this is really a learning experience, just even how to fish for these giant fishes. Yeah, another way to think about it. So th those are artificial birds, artificial mice. Uh, the the prey items of the of the trout of the taimen that are made from feathers and fur and plastic. And so we try to trick the fish into biting those artificial flies in order to catch them. And believe it or not, like scientists, we use nets. We use we use um, all different methods to catch fish for our research. But here in Mongolia, the, actually the most effective way uh, to catch these fish and keep them healthy is catching them with fishing rods. Uh, this is another photo of a taimen. This is a relatively small one. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> this, so <laughs> we, uh, we also um, have have had National Geographic um, cameramen and filmmakers over here over the years. And so some of these photos were taken by uh, an underwater photographer that came over. Um, I also host a television show called Monster Fish. And uh, we did an episode of Monster Fish uh, over here in Mongolia on the giant trout. And I think some of these underwater photos were taken at the time that we were filming the Monster Fish show over here. And one of the things that's so amazing about these fit, well, 
these fish are so amazing that the monster fish show actually included the time and in the first season of monster fish because truly around the world this is the biggest salmonid fish so all the salmon in the oceans there is no other fish that's as big as this taimen and it's really a, a cool fish and an amazing opportunity for me to go out and, and look for some river giants these are truly giants in the fish world and th these fish, they're related to uh, salmon, so Atlantic salmon, king salmon. They're also related to uh, trout. Some of you may have fished for brown trout or rainbow trout. So all of these fish are in, in the same group. They're fish that occur all over the world, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. That's all. Awesome. Next slide, please. What cool and impressive work. Are you guys ready to take some questions? <laughs> sure. Amazing. All right, let's jump to, uh, let's go to Virginia. I think we've got Miss Grindstaff and Miss Howard. I'm going to turn on your microphone and your camera. You guys want to ask me some questions? We're getting a student ready. They're calling for us right now. Noah, come to me, please. We've got the entire first grade here. Hi, this is Noah. Go ahead. Hi, Noah. Hi. How do you swim in cold? How can you try, um? How do you swim in cold water? Yeah. Yeah. How do you swim in cold water? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's real. It was really, really cold today here, and it was snowing, and it was windy, and the water's freezing cold. When we're fishing, we wear uh, waders. So we wear waterproof pants that keep us dry when we're walking in the water. And then if we go swimming, uh, uh, we wear a, uh, it's called a dry suit. How would you describe it? It's like a big bag. <laughs> it's, it's a whole outfit that no water gets through it. And you put all, all sorts of layers underneath it. So you basically, you're wearing a, you're wearing basically a blanket underneath a waterproof outfit. And that allows us to actually get, get into the water. And Zeb's gone to collect a pair of waders here. And so they're not the most comfortable or the most glamorous, but they help to keep you dry. And then you put on as much clothing as you can to try to stay warm. And today it was so cold that the water on the banks of the river was frozen solid. And so when we were going out to fish, you were crunching through the ice on the way out to cast your line. It was really amazing. That's very intense. Thank you for showing off that gear. It was so cool. Let's jump to some fourth graders. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, Ontario. I don't know if you could see those pants. Oh, we could we could see them. They came through nice and clear. Let's jump to some fourth graders uh, in London, Ontario. Stony Creek, do you have some questions for us? Yes. Awesome. Can you please tell us more about the trout's habitat and how it gets what it needs? More about the trout habitat? So the habitat, that we're, the river where we're working now is about, how can I, it's about uh, 100 feet wide, 200 feet wide. It's a, it's a small river with uh, this time of year, crystal clear water, uh, beautiful crystal clear water, lots of um, sand and rocks on the bottom, lots of aquatic plants. Uh, these big trout also live with other fish. So fish like pike, uh, smaller trout, minnows, uh, carp. And so there's a whole um, group of fish and other animals. We see birds and ducks and fish eagles. There are wolves here. There are bears here. So there's a whole ecosystem here that's that's pretty healthy. Um, and these fish, in order to survive, they need um, clear water, they need clean water, uh, they need to open river so they can move up and down the river to spawn and find good habitat. Um, and they need and they need food. And in, in this part of Mongolia, it's a fairly remote part of Mongolia with a healthy environment. The fish have everything that they need here to survive. 
And we're in the Ur River Valley. Um, and this is a really unique area where there are big mountains on both sides of us with beautiful trees. And the trees are now starting to lose their leaves as it's getting cold. And so the hillsides are golden with these, these beautiful trees and the water is crystal clear and there aren't very many people here. So most of the people we've seen since we've arrived have been riding on horseback or herding cattle through this, this river valley. And this river actually, it doesn't flow to the ocean. It flows to Lake Baikal, which is a massive lake in Russia, one of the deepest and, and largest lakes in the world. Yeah, and so Joe, Joe mentioned that there aren't many people here, but there are a few people and most of them raise livestock. And so every day in our camp, yesterday we had about 100 goats come through our camp. We've had cows come through our camp. We've had horses come through our camp. So there, there aren't many people, but there are a lot of animals. <coughs> Amazing. Thank you for walking us through that whole ecosystem. Um, Montague public school, Miss Davies class. I'm gonna turn on your microphone. Let's ask us a question. What happens if the tag falls off the fish? That is an excellent question. So that does happen sometimes. In fact, we were snorkeling, we were swimming in the water one day and I looked, I looked at, at a fish and it had a tag of another fish in its mouth. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it is possible for the fish to lose the tags. And if the fish lose the tags, then we lose the information about that fish because we can no longer identify that fish. Um, one of the other ways that we identify fish, which is a little bit more difficult, but it's, it's possible, is each fish has a unique pattern of spots, like a, like a leopard or uh, like a whale sharks also have sim uh, unique spots. Or like a fingerprint. Yeah, a fingerprint. And so we can take photos of the spots, the pattern of spots on the fish, and we can identify individual fish with the patterns of the spots. So that's another way. If, if the fish loses its tag, we may still be able to identify the fish by using the pattern of its spots. And every <coughs> fish that we've collected thus far on this trip, we've taken a nice close-up photograph of the side of the fish's head and we're hoping that with time, we'll be able to use facial recognition software, much like we have on our cell phones, to actually distinguish individual fishes so that we won't need to be using physical tags in the future or to supplement our tagging efforts. That's amazing. I see that we have a, a growing number of live viewers on YouTube. You can be asking questions too. There's a chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from. Send some questions for Zeb and Joe and we'll try and ask as many as we can. But for now, let's swing back through Stony Creek. Miss Players class, turn on your microphone. Let's have another question. Hi. Uh, Hello. Like, uh, how cold is the water when you go into the water every single day? <laughs> so in the in the summertime here, the water is warm enough to swim in just with your bathing suit. But in the wintertime here, the river has six feet of ice on it. So you can't even see the river because it's covered in so much ice. Right now we're in the in-between season. So it's just starting to snow. <clears throat> uh, tonight it's so cold that if you left a glass of water outside our uh, where we're sleeping, it would freeze solid. So now the water's starting to get very cold, almost to freezing temperature. Um, and so we were out there today when we catch fish, we, we have to keep the fish in the water. So we hold the fish in the water with our hands and the water was so cold that at first it was hurting us, but then we then our hands got numb. So it is really cold here and we have to do whatever we can uh, to try to stay warm and protect ourselves. Um, I think both Joe and I were wearing, you know, like uh, five layers of clothes today with big jackets and hats and goggles and gloves. And so we have all the gear that we need to stay warm. And I'll give you just, I do most of my work in Africa. 
where the water is always warm. And I've never been in such a cold place in my whole life. And I'm wearing three or four big jackets and then a snow parka over all of them. And I was pretty much freezing all day long anyhow. So the water is cold, the air is cold. And when you're on one of these jet boats zipping up the river, it gets really cold. You basically pull the jacket over your head and you, you hope that you get there quickly because it is really darn cold. I'm not jealous of your temperatures. We have a great question from YouTube. Miss Umar's students want to know what other unique things you're finding in the river. Yeah, so I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. In terms of just kind of artifacts and, and things that we find in the river, um, in this area, uh, so you sometimes find um, woolly mammoth tusks. Um, you can find uh, really old bones in the river sometimes uh, that are unearthed when the river changes course. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think of some of the other strange things we found in the river. Uh, we found, uh, we were swimming one time looking for, for trout and we there was um, <laughs> a dead cow in the river. So there, <laughs> there are all kinds of things in the river that we find uh have you seen anything strange in the river joe well one of the things that i find really amazing about this river is it's not just the giant trout there are so many other different fishes and one of my favorite fishes here in the river is called a grayling and it's a beautiful fish it's not quite as big as the timon but what's really amazing about this fish is it has a huge dorsal fin and almost a metallic coloration. So they're green, blue, purple, and spotted. And they're one of the most beautiful fishes that I've ever seen. So even though they're not quite as big as the Timon, to me, that's one of the coolest things that you can find in this river. Uh, one, one last thing that people have found in rivers around here, which has been both good and bad, is gold. Uh, there is a lot of gold in Mongolia. And uh, people have been finding it in rivers like the river that we study here. And sometimes when people find gold in the rivers, uh, the process of mining the gold out, you dig up the river, you try to dig the gold out of the riverbed. And that can be very, uh, um, that can be very damaging to the river and to the environment. So in some ways, uh, in some places in Mongolia, they found a lot of gold and uh, Mongolia is getting a lot of uh, money from that. But I think the fish are lucky that no gold has been found in this area yet because the river, the river is still healthy. All right. We've got another great question from YouTube. We've got students in Wisconsin wondering, Zeb, what is the biggest fish that you've ever tagged? The biggest fish I've ever tagged. So uh, I would say it's a tie, a three-way tie between Mekong giant catfish, we've tagged, well, no, that, yeah, that, about 600 pounds. And then a giant freshwater stingray, probably about five or 600 pounds. So the Mekong giant catfish was in Cambodia. The giant freshwater stingray uh, was in Thailand. And then also in, in Canada and in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, there are white sturgeon and white sturgeon can grow very, very large I think the biggest white sturgeon that I ever tagged was probably uh, 11 or 12 feet long and maybe about 500 pounds. So there, there are some very large fish that live in fresh water. And this project here, uh, one of the ways I got involved in this project is I study uh, large freshwater fish all over the world. And so there are um, about 30 or 40 species, different kinds of, of freshwater fish that grow uh, up to over six feet long or 200 pounds. And so uh, I spend a lot of my time traveling to different areas, trying to find and learn about these big fish. Wow, that's amazing. I can hardly even imagine a fish as big as three huge grown-ups. like 600 pounds is gigantic. Um, let's swing back through Ms. Davies' classroom for another question. Okay, so I got another one this how many fish do you see a day? <laughs> that, that's a good question. 
Not very many. <laughs> These fish are actually really rare. And I've been here for several days, and I've been fishing as hard as I can, and I have not caught a single timon. I think today, amongst 11 people who were out looking for these fish, I think we saw five fish. So 11 people working all day long, and we only saw five of them. So these fish are very rare, and just seeing one is and it's an amazing experience. We we were on the boat today, and uh, one of the boats caught two timon at the same time. And I was talking with the guide. He's been working here for about 15 years, and that was only the second time that he's seen people catch two fish at the same time. So we we only we don't we don't see very many of these fish a day. So whenever we see one of these fish, we get really excited. Amazing. I see a question waiting in Miss Howard's classroom. Let's go back to those first graders for another great question. All right. Why do you like fish so much? <laughs> you want to answer that? I can answer that. You. you know, one of the reasons that I love fish so much is because fish are so diverse. You have fish that can live in rivers, in lakes, in the ocean at the surface, and Oh no, it looks like we've got a frozen Joe and Zeb in more ways than one, frozen in temperature and frozen on screen. We'll see if we can get them back. I'm gonna turn off my camera for a moment to see if that's enough to clear up the bandwidth. Everybody cross your fingers. We're gonna see if they can pop out of the chat for a second and then jump back in. Sometimes that's enough to clear up the connections, especially now that we're all just little icons. All right, there go Joe and Zeb for a second. They'll come back to us in just a moment. Hopefully we can round out the day with one more question. I know we've got a great one uh, waiting in Stony Creek. Well, folks, it doesn't look like our team in Mongolia is going to be able to get back to us. Um, but you can follow their adventures all over the rest of the internet. Um, you can look on Instagram for Cutler's Catch to catch up with Joe. Uh, he posts great fish photos all the time. 
And you can check out the TV series Monster Fish to hear more about Zeb's career. Um, we think you're great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Feel free to keep sending in those questions in the YouTube chat bar, um, and we'll try and get some answers for you when we can reconnect with the team when we get back to regular internet. Like and subscribe so that you never miss any Explorer Classroom videos. Check out our full schedule and register your classroom for an on-screen spot at natgeoed.org backslash Explorer Classroom. Um, have a lovely day. I'm gonna turn on all the classroom microphones. Let's get loud for a second and give Joe and Zeb a great big thank you for when they eventually get back to school. <laughs> Study hard. Bye, guys. <laughs>